Good morning, friends. We're reading chapter 13 in the Valley of Loss. The mist had cleared from the mountains and the sun was shining, and as a consequence, the way seemed much more pleasant and easy than it had for a very long time. The path still led them along the side of the mountain rather than upwards, but one day, on, a turning, on turning a corner, they found themselves looking down into a deep valley. To their surprise, their path actually plunged straight down the mountainside towards it, exactly as at the beginning of the journey when Much Afraid had been led down into Egypt. All three halted and looked first at one another, then down into the valley and across to the other side. There the ascent was as steep and even higher than the precipice of injury, and they saw that to go down and then ascend again would not only require an immense amount of strength and effort, but also take a very long time. Much Afraid stood and stared, and at that moment experienced the sharpest and keenest test which she had yet encountered on the journey. Was she to be turned aside once again, but in an even more terrible way than ever before? By now they had ascended far higher than ever before. Indeed, if only the path they were following would begin to ascend, they could not, they could not doubt that they would soon be at the snow line and approaching the real high places where no enemies could follow and where the healing streams flowed. Now instead of that, the path was leading them down into a valley as low as the Valley of Humiliation itself. All the height which they had gained after their long and toilsome journey must now be lost, and they would have to begin all over again, just as though they had never made a start so long ago, and endured so many difficulties and tests. As she, took, as she looked down into the depths of the valley, the heart of Much Afraid went numb. For the first time on the journey, she actually asked herself, if her relatives had not been right after all, and if she ought not to have attempted to follow the shepherd. How could one follow a person who asked so much, who demanded such impossible things, who took away everything? If she went down there as far as getting to the high places was concerned, she must lose everything she had gained on the journey so far. She would, <laughs> she would be no nearer receiving the promise than when she had started out from the Valley of Humiliation. For one black, awful moment, much afraid, really considered the possibility of following the shepherd no longer, of turning back. She need not go on. There was absolutely no compulsion about it. She had been following this strange path with her two companions as guides simply because it was the shepherd's choice for her. It was not the way which she naturally wanted to go. Now she could make her own choice. Her sorrow and suffering could be ended at once, and she could plan her life in the way she liked best, without the shepherd. During that awful moment or two, it seemed to much afraid that she was actually looking into an abyss of horror, into an existence in which there was no shepherd to follow, or to trust, or to love, no shepherd at all, nothing but her own horrible self. Ever after, it seemed that she had looked straight down into hell. At the end of that moment, much afraid shrieked. There is no other word for it. Shepherd, she shrieked. Shepherd, shepherd, help me. Where are you? Don't leave me. Next instant she was clinging to him, trembling from head to foot and sobbing over and over again. You may do anything, shepherd, you may ask anything, only don't let me turn back. Oh, my lord, don't let me leave you, entreat me not to leave thee, nor to return from following after thee. Then as she continued to cling to him, she sobbed out, If you can deceive me, my lord, about the promise and the hind's feet and the new name or anything else, you may, indeed you may, only don't let me leave you. Don't let anything turn me back. The path looked so wrong, I could hardly believe it was the right one. And she sobbed bitterly. He lifted her up, supported her by his arm, and with his own hand wiped the tears from her cheeks, and said in his strong, cheery voice, There is no question of your turning back, much afraid. No one, not even your own shrinking heart, can pluck you out of my hand. Don't you remember what I told you before? This delay is not unto death, but for the glory of God. You haven't forgotten already the lesson you have been learning, have you? It is no less true now that what I do thou knowest not. That It is no less true now that what I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know, af know hereafter. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. It is perfectly safe for you to go on, on in this way, even though it looks so wrong. And now I give you another promise. Thine ears shall hear a word behind thee saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it, when ye turn to the right hand or to the left. He paused a moment, and she still leant against, leant against him, speechless with thankfulness and relief at his presence. Then he went on, Will you bear this too much afraid? Will you suffer yourself to lose or to be deprived of all that you have gained on this journey to the high places? Will you go down to this path of forgiveness into the valley of loss? 
just because it is the way that I have chosen for you. Will you still trust and still love me? She was still clinging to him and now repeated with all her heart the words of another woman tested long ago. Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest I will go. Thy people shall be my people and thy God my God. She paused and faltered a moment, then went on in a whisper, And where thou diest I will, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. So another altar was built at the top of the descent into the valley of loss, and another stone added to those in the bag she still carried in her bosom. After that they began the downward journey, and as they went, she heard her two guides singing softly, O oh, whither is thy beloved gone, thou fairest among women? Where dost thou think he has turned aside, that we may seek him with thee? The shepherd himself sang the next verse. He has gone down into his garden to the beds of spices sweet, for he feedeth among the lilies. Tis there we are wont to meet. Then much afraid herself sang the last two verses, and her heart was so full of joy that even her unmelodious voice seemed changed and sounded as sweet as the others. So I went down into the garden, the valley of buds and fruits, to see if the pomegranates budded, to look at the vine stalk shoots. And my soul, in a burst of rapture, or ever I was aware, sped swifter than chariot horses, for lo, he was waiting there. Considering how steep it was, the descent down into the valley seemed surprisingly easy, but perhaps that was because much afraid desired, with her whole will, to make it in a way that would satisfy and please the shepherd. The awful glimpse down into the abyss of an existence without him had so staggered and appalled her heart that she felt she could never be quite the same again. However, it had opened her eyes to the fact that right down in the depths of her own heart she really had but one passionate desire, not for the things which the shepherd had promised, but for himself. All she wanted was to be allowed to follow him ever, follow him forever. Other desires might clamor strongly and fiercely near the surface of her. That was my cat acting crazy. Other desires might clamor strongly and fiercely near the surface of her nature, but she knew not that down in the core of her own being she was so shaped that nothing could fit, fill, or satisfy her heart but he himself. Nothing else really matters, she said to herself, only to love him and to do what he tells me. I don't know quite why it should be so, but it is. All the time it is suffering to love and sorrow to love, but it is lovely to love him in spite of this. And if I should cease to do so, I should cease to exist. So as has been said, they reached the valley very quickly. The next surprising thing that was, was that Though the valley did seem at first a little like a prison after the strong bracing air of the mountains, it turned out to be a wonderfully beautiful and peaceful place, very green and with flowers covering the fields and the banks of the river which flowed quiet, quietly through it. Strangely enough, down there in the valley of loss, much afraid felt more rested, more peaceful, and more content than anything else on the journey. It seemed, too, that her two companions also underwent a strange transformation. They still held her hands, but there was neither suffering nor sorrow in the touch. It was as though they walked close beside her and went hand in hand simply for friendship's sake and for the joy of being together. Also, they sang continually, sometimes in a language quite different from the one which she had learnt from them. But when she asked the meaning of the words, they only smiled and shook their heads. This is one of the many songs which all three sang down in the Valley of Loss. And it was another from the collection in the old songbook much afraid so loved. I am my loved and he is mine. And this is his desire that with his beauty I may shine in radiant attire, and this will be when all of me is pruned and purged with fire. Come, my beloved, let us go forth to the waiting field, and where thy choicest fruit trees grow, thy pruning knife now yield, that at, that, that at thy will and through thy skill their richest store may yield, and spices give, and spices give a sweet perfume and vine show tender shoots, and all my trees burst forth in bloom, fair buds from bitter roots. There will not, there will not I my love deny, but yield that thee pleasant fruits. But yield thee present, <laughs> yield thee present pleasant fruits. I can't read this morning. It is true that when much afraid looked at the mountains on the other side of the valley, she wondered how they would ever manage to ascend them, but she found herself content to wait restfully and to wander in the valley as long as the shepherd chose. 
One thing in particular comforted, comforted her after the hardness and slipperiness of the way on the mountains, where she had stumbled and limped so painfully, she found that in those quiet green fields she could actually walk without stumbling and could not feel her wounds and scars and stiffness at all. All this seemed a little strange because, of course, she really was in the Valley of Loss. Also, apparently, she was farther from the high places than ever before. She asked the shepherd about it one day, but the loveliest part of all was that he often walked with them down there, saying with a beautiful smile that it was one of his favorite haunts. In answer to her question, he said, I am glad that you are learning to appreciate the valley, too, but I think it was the altar which you built at the top, Bunch of Fade, which was ma has made it easy for you. This also rather puzzled her, for she said, But I have noticed that after the other altars which you told me to build, the way was generally, has generally seemed harder and more testing than before. Again he smiled, but only remarked quietly that the important thing about altars was that they made possibilities of apparent impossibilities, and that it was nice that on this occasion it had brought her peace and not a great struggle. She noticed that he looked at her keenly and rather strangely as he spoke, and though there was a beautiful gentleness in the look, there was also something else which she had seen before but still did not understand. She thought it held a mixture of two things, not exactly pity, no, that was the wrong word, but a look of wonderful compassion together with unflinching determination. When she realized that, she thought of some words which one of the shepherd's servants had spoken down in the Valley of Humiliation, before ever the shepherd had called her to the high places. He had said, Love is beautiful, but it is also terrible, terrible in its determination to allow nothing blemished or unworthy to remain in the beloved. When she remembered this, much afraid thought that thought with a little shiver in her heart, he will never be content until he makes me what he has determined that I ought to be. And because she was still much afraid, and not yet ready to change her name, she added with a pang of fear, I wonder what he plans to do next, and if it will hurt very much indeed. Have a wonderful day, friends. God bless you.